Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with a very good friend of mine, Dr. Asim Malotra. Asim is both a practicing cardiologist and a professor of evidence-based medicine. He's a founding member of Action on Sugar and has led work highlighting the harm caused by excess sugar consumption in our country, particularly in its role in type 2 diabetes. Asim has written for dozens of publications, including the British Medical Journal, The Guardian and Observer, BBC Online, Huffington Post, The Daily Mirror, The Daily Mail, The Daily Telegraph and The Washington Post. In 2018, he was ranked by Analytica as the number one doctor in the world influencing our thinking on obesity. His first book, co-authored with Donald O'Neill, The Pyopi Diet, was published in 2017 and is already an international bestseller. Dr. C, great having you with me again. Last session was absolutely fascinating looking at uh, the heart of a great diet and, and a lot around your, your, your poppy diet. Um, for those that haven't listened to that show yet, give us a brief, brief introduction about yourself. And today we're going to talk about why too much exercise might kill you. Okay, that's, so we're going to talk about exercise more today rather than just, just diets. But for everybody at home that's, that's new to you, yeah. uh, let's have a brief introduction. So uh, I'm a consultant cardiologist. I've been practicing medicine for almost 19 years, uh, specializing in cardiology for the last 10 years, originally trained in doing keyhole heart surgery. Now shifted my focus more to prevention because uh, my personal mission or aim is to save a million lives at a time, Brilliant. not just uh, a few. And, um, and, and my main focus, my area of interest in research now is about preventing and potentially reversing heart disease. Okay. So preventing, I can understand, reversing heart disease, that once somebody's already had symptoms or a heart attack or some sort of card cardiovascular so it's quite incident. A, so or... quite a broad term, actually, uh, Steve. So there's one of what are the various risk factors that combine together to make you more likely to develop heart disease and have a heart attack. And we know that those risk factors, from my own experience and what I advocate with my lifestyle plan, uh, we know those risk factors can be reversed uh, very quickly, you know, uh, in uh, even within 21 days, within a few weeks, which most people find wow. quite extraordinary. So well, that's great news, isn't it? Um, absolutely. It's great because then, you know, they're in a much healthier position for the long term. Now, to truly reverse heart disease, we're talking about a narrowing in the artery um, that develops over time, reducing uh, that narrowing, reducing that sort of... Uh, we call it a stenosis is a, is a medical term for it. And um, there is evidence out there that that happens and, and, that, and that can be done. The only question is we don't know exactly, although I'm pretty sure my, in my own mind, um, we don't have what we call the, the highest quality best studies to prove it 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it does happen. Sure. I've seen it happen with, uh, with my patients. And um, there are re there's research out there showing a combination of things uh, that, that people do relate to their diet and reducing stress and exercising and stopping smoking contribute to that potential process. So uh, my next stage of the phase is that I have um, you know, designed a trial, a clinical trial to try and prove that. Um, and I'm working obviously on getting that underway. I think one of the things as we discussed, discussed before, one of the issues or problems in modern research is bias funding. So the funding has to come from somebody who isn't there to profit from the results. So either government funding or an independent body um, to make that study happen. But irrespective, patients who follow this plan of mine will reverse their risk factors quite quickly. So I, I, and, and what I want to do is get this widespread across the world because then we will genuinely curb, reduce heart disease. Well, let's get straight into detail. And let me just say that because of people like you and all the research I've done, when I was late 40s, obese, friends dying of cancer, family dying of cancer, I was convinced I wouldn't last to 60 years old just because it was, it was, it was just prevalent all around me. 
I'm now gunning for a hundred, right? So I'm gunning for a hundred. Uh, and while I understand quite a lot about how to avoid cancers, uh, quite a lot about how to avoid uh, diabetes and Alzheimer's, I really want to hear from you then how I do my absolute best to make sure to avoid the heart attack. Because one of the things the heart attack, it happened, a, a, a friend of mine, Colin, died in his 60s last year, an XPE teacher. And he was the last person anybody would have thought would drop dead of a heart attack. And one of the things that scares me a little bit with the heart attack is that while obesity comes on slowly and you can see the physical signs of it, uh, when Alzheimer's, of course, you can, you, know, you can see the signs of it. Um, arthritis, you can see the signs. Heart attacks can just appear to happen overnight. So I really want to hear in this hour, yeah. uh, again, linking back to exercise and sure. how important that is, or can we do too much of it? Um, Talk us through in detail, in detail then, what is the heart attack? What causes it? What's the best way to make sure we're not, you know, it still is the most prevalent uh, cause of early death in the UK, I believe. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Globally, West, in the Western world, certainly it is. Uh, in Europe, it's the number one cause of death in, uh, prematurely in men specifically as well. So dying under the age of 65 yeah. is heart attacks. And there are still places in the world, cut off remote places in the Andes, the, the Maasai, uh, in Kenya and Tanzania, where heart attacks just don't happen, so yeah. it must be, it must have a preventable element to it because there are parts of the world where it just doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to under, so first of all, we let's define heart attack. So heart okay. attack is basically when there is a sudden reduction in blood supply to the heart muscle. So the heart is a is a muscle that pumps blood all around the body and provides oxygen and nutrients to all our cells. Um, when there's a sudden reduction in blood supply to the heart muscle, supplied by the coronary arteries, so these are the heart has its own separate blood supply of coronary arteries, um, that lasts long enough to cause damage to the cells of the heart muscle. Okay. And that can be small or it can be large. As soon as there's damage to the cells, we call it cell death. Because of that reduction in blood supply, that's called a heart attack. And that's diagnosed from a history from a patient, that, but ultimately from a... Um, from using an ECG, a heart tracing, and a blood test. A blood test that indicates cell death. We call that troponin. So that's how we diagnose heart attacks. Now, it's interesting what you mentioned about, um, you know, very sad about your friend, but 50% of heart attacks, roughly, happen with no preceding warning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and about 50% of people who have heart attacks don't make it to hospital alive. So this can be all okay. very sudden. Yes. And the reason why people don't get any warning is um, for some people that suffer heart attacks, they usually may be diagnosed with what we call angina. You may have heard that term, angina. Yes, have you heard that before? So a lot of people have heard that. You get tightening of the chest. Yeah, so yeah. it's a classic feeling of a, a chest tightness yeah. in the center of the chest that happens with exertion and is all with stress and is relieved by rest. Sometimes it can go up into the jaw, down the left arm. If that happens with exertion relieved by rest, you must see your doctor because it's, uh, it, there's a strong chance it could be angina. An angina isn't a heart attack, so what's actually happening in the arteries is usually for angina to happen, at least 70% of your artery needs to be blocked. Okay? Right. So what happens is when the heart undergoes stress in the sense of it needs more oxygen with exercise, that 70% narrowing suddenly becomes, it's not available, it's not, a, there's not enough blood to hit the heart and mm -hmm. then you get pain in the chest. That's what so San January is. So you don't notice it day to day, but as soon as you put a bit of load on the system because yes. you're trying to pump more blood through a narrowed artery and try to pump it faster, that's yes. when you get angina. angina. Absolutely. Now, what's interesting though, and coming back to why 50% of people who have heart attacks have no pre-warning signs or no angina preceding it for months or years beforehand, is... And this is where something that has um, I've been involved in trying to shift that understanding is that most heart attacks happen at narrowings that are not 70%. They may be 20%, they may be 30%, they may be 40%. So they won't cause any problems in terms of symptoms with exercise or stress, but suddenly what happens is that narrowing, I liken it to like a pimple. Okay, imagine okay. a pimple or a volcano yeah. or something yeah. that if it stays as it is, doesn't cause a problem, the volcano, but if the volcano erupts, you've got a problem. So suddenly that pimple of the volcano that erupts or bursts or whatever, and it releases the contents of the inside of that inside the blood vessel, mm -hmm. and then suddenly a clot forms, and it takes minutes for a clot to form. And you say that, that that volcano is on the inside lining of the artery wall? Yes, okay. absolutely, absolutely. Good. And then that clot forms, 
you get a complete, often a complete occlusion then of that whole yes. artery because of yep. the clot, the body's reacting forms a clot yep. and the blood doesn't go through and then you have a heart attack. So that's how it happens. So often it's a, that's why a lot of people don't get any warning signs. So, and the other thing to mention as well, which is interesting, a lot of people have heard of heart stents. So these are little metal scaffoldings that are put into people with stable heart disease or to treat a heart attack when it's happening. But we know actually, it was interesting from data that even if you have a 90% blockage that's stable, hasn't caused a heart attack, that's found from you know, an angiogram, if you put a metal scaffold in there to try and um, you know, stretch the artery and open up that narrowing, mm -hmm. that doesn't prevent heart attacks or prolong life because the process behind heart attacks is an inflammatory one that causes a sudden eruption. Um, and if you have a gradual narrowing in your artery, so another side of all of this, say you don't have that eruption, that sudden clot forming, yes. yeah. if the narrowing which develops over, over years, it can start even in teenage, mm -hmm. right? Small starts with a small fatty streak of inflammatory cells and cholesterol and all that. If that builds up over time gradually, that will rarely cause a heart attack even if it 100% blocks gradually, because... Blood has found its alternative routes yes, around. Yes, we call that collateral vessels, so new right. blood vessels form. Yeah. So for me, having... So people need to understand that first. Once you understand that, then the question is, well, 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 well what can you do to reduce the risk of that if there's a narrowing there that's developed, that so you've got, you know, how do you reduce the risk of that causing a heart attack or rupturing or erupting or whatever? Um, and can you potentially reduce that narrowing? So let's talk about reducing the rupture first, the chances of it happening. Um, and there that's are, the bit we're really worried about. Exactly. Yeah. So there are things that's you can do. my friend Colin who, no symptoms, just, yeah. just happen. Yeah. At any point in your life, there's something you can do that can reduce the risk of rupture. So if you're a smoker, we know stopping smoking is, you know, one of the most important, as a smoker, the most important thing you can do to prolong your life. More important than any medications we can throw at you yep. if you're diagnosed with heart disease, uh, reducing risk of heart attack and prolonging your life. So stopping smoking because, you know, the toxins uh, that are inhaled that get into the bloodstream are pro-inflammatory and they contribute to the likelihood of this volcano or pimple bursting or erupting, okay? So stopping smoking. Reducing stress, like severe stress can suddenly cause these things. So sometimes you see in films, mm -hmm. somebody's heard some bad news or something's happened and suddenly yeah. they're clutching their chest and they're falling down. That's acute stress reaction. Well, sadly, in the last couple of months, you know, there, are, there are so many marathons where people have died in the marathon, taking part in a, in, you know, a big exercise event. And I guess that's that, isn't it? The muscles, must, the, 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 the yeah. artery walls must be so stressed while you're... Yeah, so I think on that note, I mean, let's hours. talk about, we'll come on to the other diet stuff in a minute, but on the exercise stuff, um, it's quite interesting this, because again, this is someone talking to someone like yourself, and we were avid, obsessive exercisers. But, and people, some people still think that if you exercise really well and you do loads of exercise, you'll never develop heart disease. That's completely false. In fact, one study published in 2017 showed that... Um, people that did about seven and a half hours of exercise, quite moderate to intense exercise a week. There are people out there that do that, and crazy yeah. stuff. They exercise to that level. They develop more heart disease yeah. than people that did moderate activity, a lot more than people that did moderate activity, which is basically uh, you know, um, two and a half hours a week mm -hmm. of moderate activity. Um, now, the, re the way that was discovered over a 25 year period follow-up is that people, when they did these scans called calcium scores, which is a, a scan that can actually be a good marker of how much heart disease you've got. They had much calcium higher... is the thing that builds up in the in the artery walls that then explodes. Is that right? No. Well, yeah, it's part of that plaque. It's a marker of underlying narrowings, and the higher your calcium score, the more narrowings you're likely to have. Okay. So it's just part of what goes on with that inflammatory process. So what happens is the artery gets damaged. There's inflammation. It then forms this little pimple, and it can build up over time, and then suddenly it can release its contents, yeah. rupture, and mm -hmm. cause that clot. And calcium is part of that process. Mm -hmm. So okay. calcium is a marker, and it'd be, you, you can do a scan using x-rays to, to look at the calcium. They found in those people that had very high levels of exercise, up to middle age, so up to about 50, 55 years old, um, they had higher calcium scores that did more exercise than the people that did less. Now, to be fair, just to, you know, we're talking about can too much exercise kill you? I think it can. That may also be different to saying that necessarily resulted in them dying earlier. We don't know that, but logically you'd think there's more heart disease, they're more at risk of death. Yeah, it's um, interesting that, you know, we all think that people have been jogging forever. But my view on this is that 
exercise should be what the body's designed for, what it's evolved from. Yes. So you need to walk more because we were all nomadic thousands of years ago. So yeah. We all need to get out and walk more. We need to lift heavier things because we've got to keep out, especially as we age. You should, you should see, I believe, older people in the gym more than younger people because we need to keep our muscles as we as we age. But this relentless jogging, which I used to be part of that fraternity, actually is quite a modern thing. In fact, it, it, a guy called Ken Cooper uh, in America uh, in the late 60s, they reckon back in 1968 in America, less than 100,000 people classed themselves as joggers. Within two years after Ken Cooper coined the phrase aerobics, there was something like 30 million people starting to jog. So jogging actually is quite alien to, to the human body. Anyway, Ken Cooper, and I admire this man because he did a complete U-turn. He's a guy that, that educated presidents and Olympic sports stars on more exercise is better, is better and better. And towards the last latter end of his life, he said, I got it completely wrong. Yeah, I assumed that more exercise meant longer life. Well, actually, if you go over the top, it actually shortens life. So it's just getting that balance right yeah. when it comes to exercise. And that's a good point. So they did a very a large study, observational study, looking at ex-Olympic athletes. And they found that elite athletes don't live any go longer than golfers or cricketers. Mm -hmm. So what I say is a little goes a long way. Know why you're exercising it and listen to your body. Sure. Um, one of the problems with jogging, I mean, a lot of my friends are orthopedic surgeons. And they said to me, they're seeing more and more people in their 30s and 40s having knee and hip replacements yep. because they're jogging on the road. He said, mm -hmm. no one should be running on the road. But there's this kind of mentality driven by whatever, seeing stuff on TV or thinking, seeing it looks good. And it's also not the best, as you know, Steve, it's not the best way to get a cardio anyway. Sure. You know, yeah. you're only yeah. um, going to a certain level when you do, you know, it's much better to do things like high intensity interval training for shorter periods, you know, use compound movements use your, you know, get your glutes involved, yeah. your quads, obviously we, in the Big Fat Fix, um, we talk about all of this stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so, is you know, there, so, so thing, can you get cardio, yeah. but without damaging your joints? And I think people need to think about that because some people get properly crippled yeah. in older age because, and they've been, you know, do, doing marathons and stuff and they, they can't walk and it's not nice. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be that person. Well, I was that person. I was that 10 to 15 hours a week jogging, full on cycling, I've had to have a knee replacement. And it just goes on and on and on. And all that time I was obese. So it isn't the answer to losing weight yeah. for sure. Is it the answer for happiness and longevity? I don't think so because no. it's, not, it's alien the, to the chronic body. Chronic pain yeah. is not nice. Yeah. You know, even if you're an athlete, to have chronic pain, it, it, you know, it makes you depressed. It's not a nice place to be. And I've had injuries in my life. I've had to change my exercise routine completely. I used to be a runner. Mm -hmm. 5K, slam it, you know, every morning, wake up at 6, run 5K on the treadmill take a shower into the operating theater for the next 10 hours or whatever. Um, and it started to affect my knees. So I've not, I've stopped in the last few years. I don't run anymore. I do some occasional sprints, very short sprints, mm -hmm. but I don't do that running on a treadmill for 5K three times a week anymore. No. Yeah, in fact, uh, our belief in, in the Primal Living book, we, we call it our mom's principle, MO, max out, max out. So high interval training where you're lifting, uh, not massively heavy weights, but till you just can't move them anymore. Sure. Because I believe something as you age, you shouldn't be lifting massive big dumbbells because then you're going to hurt yourself. But light dumbbells, light bars, but just keep going until you can't move anymore and really max out the muscles. Then we say the best one of all is the middle bit of MOMS, MM, move more. Yeah. Just get out and walk. And yes. In the infographic you're going to share a little bit later, you say that one of the best ways to prevent a heart attack is just get out and walk. I think you said 22 minutes per day. Uh, World Health, Health Organization, quote, 25 minutes a day. But in that region of 20, 25 minutes, yeah. just get out and do it every single day. The way day we came with 20, 22 minutes was basically, um, it was times by seven, roughly, to get 150 minutes a week. Gotcha. So we said 22 minutes a week. day. But just get your heart rate up yeah. to get you a little bit breathless. Uh, uh, and, and that's then, what uh, they're doing, the, all these blue, you know, these people were outside, they were walking. That's all you need. Your yeah. body doesn't need... In terms of longevity, now, okay, there are other things as you get older. One of the things that happens is you lose muscle mass. We call it sarcopenia. Uh, and that is an issue, especially for the elderly. They're more vulnerable to falling and injuring themselves, breaking a hip. You know, something you want to try and avoid. If you break a hip, 25% of those people will die in hospital. So it's a oh. big issue. So a bit of resistance training, a bit yep. of lifting stuff, yep. functional movements, um, really important as well. Yeah, I say you should always see more older people <laughs> bench pressing in the gym than younger people because we do, uh, you know, we do lose our muscle mass. I think it's five percent every ten years as we get older. Sure. Right. Next question then. So, uh, if it's not going out and killing ourselves on the running track or cycling like crazy to avoid a heart attack, 
what can we do to reverse any symptoms we've already got or to lessen our chances of being one of those poor people that it just they just drop dead of a heart attack what do we do to, to, to lessen our chances so to reduce the risk i think um you know all the uh, data i've analyzed is basically following a dietary pattern that is uh, a mediterranean diet that's low in sugar and and starchy carbohydrates which is higher in base fat of extra virgin olive oil i mean i uh, I would describe olive oil, looking at the data and its effects on the body, good quality olive oil, like a medicine, mm -hmm. to be honest. And if you think about that that kind of potential volcano that's about to erupt in the arteries and you see that kind of fire burning, you know, I would say, you know, to explain it, if you have the olive oil with your vegetables and oily fish, and oil, it's almost like um, dousing the fuels, uh, the flames of that fire, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if, you, if you think about that. So kind of the artery and that will just, it's about stabilizing what's already there to reduce the risk of that causing your problems down the line. And, um, and when you say olive oil, Malcolm, big fan of omega-3s as well. Does that fit into the same category? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So oily fish, yeah. um, you know, certain seeds, flaxseed, for example. Exactly. You know, these omega-3s are very, very good, very anti-inflammatory. And avoiding, the other thing actually to avoid, which a lot of people probably don't know about, is um, cooking in what I call industrial seed oils, like sunflower soybean oil, that kind of stuff. When you heat those oils up, they become quite toxic at, at relatively, you know, not very high temperatures and they're pro-inflammatory. So you want to be cooking. Ideally, your base fat should be extra virgin olive oil. But on top of that, then if you're doing that, then there's no issue with having some butter and coconut oil and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, ghee, you know, I use this all the time. But the main thing is get at least four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil in per day. I probably get about 10. Isn't that amazing that all the things you just mentioned five years ago was the enemy? You know, people say saturated fat, that's what clogs the artery. But all the ones you just mentioned, coconut oil is, is high in MCT, saturated fat, uh, butter's high in saturated fat, meats are high in saturated fat. Well, even extra all, virgin olive oil has 14 to 20% yeah. saturated fat, which yeah. is higher than what we're recommended to consume in terms of total calories. And yet all so, the fats we should be avoiding are the manufactured, man-made, hydrogenated, the margarines, the, the oils they, they probably use in chip shops. And yeah. yeah. And I was saying to you earlier on, you know, my other job is around gemstones and how frustrated for years I've been with Swarovski crystal, calling their Swarovski crystals crystals when they're not crystals. Uh, and it's just this big con. And it's like, if you want to look at, you know, oil got a bad name and fat got a bad name yeah. around heart attacks and everything. And yet all the things they said was bad for us, saturated fat, they're actually the natural ones that are part of the solution. Yeah. Part of the problem is all those vegetable oils. And the reason we mentioned Swarovski, because Swarovski isn't a crystal and vegetable oil isn't made from vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just ridiculous. Absolutely. So avoid those um, types of man-made yeah. oils. Get back to natural fats. Absolutely. And, and even even nuts, you know, high in fatty acids that are thought to be anti-inflammatory. So a tree nuts, I would say, a handful of either almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, um, very good. Brazil nuts are also very good. So I would say a handful of those every day. Uh, this is what I advise my patients to do. And you're, you know, going, you're a long way to reducing your risk significantly of, of a heart problem. But again, not to do things in isolation. Make sure you're doing at least a bit of more. Don't be sedentary. Um, and really think about reducing your stress levels. Now, some people are great at listening and absorbing information. Some people are better with images. So for those who are listening on the podcast, um, then I'm, we're going to bring up a, an infographic from the British Journal of Sports. And if you uh, maybe pause right now and just type into Google or any other search engine, saturated fats does not clog arteries you'll find uh, this uh, infographic that you were part of uh, putting together. Yeah. Talk us through then yeah. what it is we're looking at here. So um, so this was an editorial published in British Journal of Sports Medicine. I was a lead author. There were two other eminent cardiologists actually involved in this. So it wasn't just a seam hot trick causing trouble again. Um, you know, there <laughs> well, was some... you don't cause trouble. You, you, you're just <laughs> doing things for the no, right No, reasons. absolutely. But, yeah. but two, so they're both edited in medical journals. So it gave it a lot. I think it gave it extra credibility that this is something that people should take notice of. Um, and, and actually the rest of that title, so saturated fat does not clog the arteries. Coronary heart, heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition that can be effectively managed with lifestyle interventions. Quite a long title, but that okay. was kind of shifting that paradigm. Do you want me to just say it one more time? Because I think that's, so, so, that's so musical satur for me. So saturated fat does yep. not clog the arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition 
that can be effectively combated or managed with lifestyle interventions. And that, so, and therefore, if it can be managed, it can therefore be reversed. Absolutely, I believe that that is the case. And uh, at the very least, even if you're not necessarily reducing the narrowings, you can stop those narrowings from causing a heart attack and just remain stable for the rest of your life, potentially, if you do these lifestyle changes. Um, so this infographic, which is there, if you Google it, you can have a look at it, basically shows, um, at, first of all, at the bottom, it shows the root of, of heart disease. It's a combination of insulin resistance, which is, um, as in layman's terms, excess body fat, you know, often related to too much starch and sugar in the diet, um, and systemic inflammation. And what causes that is basically you know, the wrong sorts of diet, too much stress, smoking, being sedentary. So therefore, to combat it, you sort your diet out. Yep. Um, and we talk about, you know, I, I recommend personally a, a higher fat Mediterranean diet. So that's, you know, base of it, lots of vegetables, extra virgin olive oil, nuts, oily fish, moderate intake of cheese and yogurt. A lot of these, you know, certainly in Piopi and some of the, and we think that, interesting on dairy, there's been a lot of controversy on dairy, but at the moment the data suggests, and again, it's not the most robust, you know, conclusive data, but it suggests that full fat dairy may protect you, protect you from heart disease and type 2 Isn't diabetes. And plus it's nutritious and you enjoy it. A so complete it, U-turn of views. Absolutely. Yeah. So I say moderate intake of cheese and yogurt and something that's low in sugar and refined carbohydrates. Don't say you have to completely avoid it altogether, but you should try and reduce it significantly. And then combined with that is regular activity. We say walking 22 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, moderate mm -hmm. activity. So getting your heart rate up to at least 50% of your target heart rate. What does that mean? So everybody has a target heart rate, a maximum heart rate, which is a simple calculation, 220 minus your age. Okay. So yep. if you're a 40 year old person, 220 minus your age is 180. Yeah. And you want to get to at least 50% of that yep. for 30 minutes. Yeah. Ideally 50 to 70% something like that. So that means getting it to 90 beats a minute. And you can use apps if you want yep. to check that. Get that for at least 30 minutes a day or 22 minutes a day if you like. Um, uh, to get to 150 minutes a week. And that, in layman's terms, is that a fast-paced walk as yes. opposed to a run? Yes, right. it's a okay. brisk walk. Yeah, Brisk walk. So that's the exercise side of things. And of course, you can do other stuff as well, of course, that you enjoy. You know, I say... Yeah, if you like do tennis what, or your golf or... Do your... what you enjoy, whether it's dancing, cycling. Yeah. Uh, I wrote an article in the Washington Post when we... When we um, on the back of another British Trust Sports Medicine article I'd written called Busting the Myths of Physical, Physical Activity and said dancing, cycling, sex even, yeah. you know. Preferably not all three at the same time. Not be a bit <laughs> that could be dangerous. <laughs> could be very dangerous. Um, and then stress reduction, big thing, really important is meditation, yoga. Um, there is some good studies out there showing that it does reduce the risk of having heart attacks yep. and, and even death rates from introducing that, especially people who are at high risk of heart disease who have had heart attacks already. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very big advocate of that, not just for physical, but even mentally. My patients feel so much better mentally when they do that within weeks of doing meditation, you know, half an hour a day. Now, we, we talk about reducing the, the facts. How quickly can this, obviously we don't know that our arteries are clogging up. Lots of people now are suggesting that if you're concerned at all, go and have a CAC scan to see what your calcium levels are. But yeah. if you're not having a CAC scan and you're worried because maybe you know you've been overweight for a long time, maybe you were an ex-smoker, maybe you, you drank too much. How quick can we start seeing benefits if we start to follow what you're suggesting here with the, the high-fat Mediterranean diet, yeah. getting out and walking? Is, does it take years and years? No, it, it depends where you're starting from, Steve, to be honest. But if you are already, you have what we call metabolic syndrome. Yeah. So metabolic syndrome is a synonymous, another way of describing insulin resistance. But specifically, the reason I talk about metabolic syndrome, and I'll define it now, is two-thirds of people having heart attacks now have metabolic syndrome. Okay. Um, and most of them, interestingly, have normal cholesterol levels, but we'll come on to that in a minute because I think I'm sure people want to hear a bit more about cholesterol and why we should not worry about it so much. But metabolic syndrome is basically any three of these five. High blood pressure, pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, high blood triglycerides, low HDL, so-called good cholesterol, and increased waist circumference. So we think about those, yep. metabolic syndrome being the big issue with heart disease. How quickly can you reverse those risk factors? It can happen within weeks, 21 days. Yeah. You know, I've seen it happen, and again, it's where you start, but if you've got metabolic syndrome, you can reverse, get out of the definition of having metabolic syndrome, um, you know, uh, within a few weeks of changing your lifestyle. It's that quick. 
And syn let me, let's break down the word metabolic and syndrome, because I hate I, every conference I go to at the moment, people say metabolic syndrome, uh, all these things now, the main cause of death in the UK and yeah. westernized society, uh, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, obesity, all of these can relate in a big part to metabolic syndrome. Yes. And they don't happen in cut-off areas like I keep saying the Andes and many of the blue zones, you know, they just they don't it's have a these disease diseases. of modern civilization. You're absolutely right. It's a cluster of risk factors. Yeah. And it it is uh, you know uh, I think there's very good evidence to say yeah it's not just about heart disease. It's about cancer and dementia as well. Yeah. So I I think that um, this is with the information we have in terms of lifestyle and the impact that this is the best available data we have to show how you can. Um, you know, stop this happening or at least very least delay it and, and, and live a, a decent, healthy life for most of your life. I just want to come back to that again one more time because it's really encouraging, I think, that if we say metabolic syndrome, you, you have two or three of those symptoms, uh, a large stomach, uh, high blood pressure, uh, you know, um, and, and so on and so forth. If they're all related, but you can revert, start, start the reversing process in three weeks or so, 21 days, that's really encouraging, isn't it? Because, you know, even if you were an ex-smoker, even if, uh, you, you know, you just you know, maybe drank too much for such a long period, I put myself in that camp, um, and ate all the wrong foods because I was used to be massive on carbohydrates because of all the running and all the sports. Yeah. The encouraging thing is, look, take it seriously because these are lifestyle changes that are way more important than obsessing about cholesterol and things like this. Absolutely. 100%. And yeah. that, that, that is rapid. And I see that with my patients. In fact, there was a, the Piopi diet was released in Holland, uh, the Dutch version, a day after a documentary film was made where they actually took three um, you know, Dutch citizens. I was there to explain the science and said, Dr. Malhotra, we want to test out your theory about this 21-day reversal. One chap um, had type 2 diabetes, about to go on insulin. The other chap had high blood pressure, diagnosed with stable heart disease. And, and the third, the lady had struggled with weight for many years, had had bariatric surgery, but it was then now clinically obese as well. And I explained to them the science, explained a U-turn on what they should be doing in terms of what they eat. And it was actually very emotional for them because they were followed by a GP, all their blood markers. And a month later, it was actually 28 days in the end just because of the way the filming was, they were told their results. The chap with type 2 diabetes about to go on insulin came off his medications and sent his type 2 diabetes into remission wow. just from following Piopi diet. Um, the guy with the high blood pressure, similar, um, he was able to reduce the doses of his blood pressure pills, come off one or two of them as well, um, and felt great because of it. He also lost some weight around his, mm -hmm. his, his belly. And the lady with, uh, who had weight issues, and again, part of also this is there's no counting calories. You eat till you're full, basically. Yes. You don't yes. snack, but you yeah. eat two or three meals a day and eat till you're full yep. and enjoy your food. Um, the lady with, with the weight problems lost 10 kilograms and couldn't believe it and said she felt great. So it, it showed that this stuff works, and it, then the book was released in Holland, and you know, I was pleasantly surprised that for the next six weeks it was number one on all the charts in Holland. You know, it, was, it had a really big impact because of this, this program. Well, someone quite famous bought your book, and I don't think you knew him at the time, uh, who's the deputy leader of the uh, Labour Party, Tom Watson. Yeah. Uh, and I met Tom a few months back, and he accredited, I mean, you know, he was diabetic, he was massively overweight, obviously stressed as a politician. And... Um, you know, he puts it all down to following your diet, and look at him now, he's a picture of good Yeah, good health. It did. I'm so pleased for him, actually. Uh, I think Tom has been public about the fact that, you know, he's getting into his 50s, and he was uh, suddenly got very worried and scared about the fact that he was seeing, you know, colleagues of his, some Labour politicians who died of heart disease prematurely, and he thought, I don't want to be that person. Um, and then he contacted me initially through Twitter, um, I think about six months into the fact he was following the diet, and said, and I was, you know, and he said, I, I've been following your plan and I've lost, I think at that stage, 66 pounds or something like that. Wow. But I want to see how long I can sustain it and if it's sustainable. And then he's been able to continue. And I think he's lost a total of 100 pounds. Um, and he's doing really well. Yeah, so it was, great, it, was it? A, it was an amazing advocate for, for this. Um, and, and go back to your trial a moment ago. Hmm. And also Tom, because Tom had been overweight for a long, long time. Not only can you, it appears, reverse it. It's always easy to reverse it if you've only just got, say, diabetes. You know, if you can catch it early enough try and avoid the medication possibly and try and change your lifestyle first before you commit to a lifestyle of medication. But I'm sure it was you or somebody I, I, I was listening to recently that said, you've even seen people that have been 25 years on medication that once they commit yes. to reversing it, it can still happen. Absolutely. 
It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, and some of my patients come to me who are, some of them who've come to the NHS in the first time and said, by the way, doc, you know, uh, I've been on blood pressure pills for 15 years. I went in your diet plan, just started walking again, nothing else. And within three months stopped three of the four blood pressure medications he'd been on for 15 years. Yeah. And never felt better. So it does have that, you know, it does have that rapid impact. There's another question about sustainability. And I think that's an important question. Um, in general, you know, people say why most diets fail, people change stuff, it helps in the short term, and then they fall off the wagon. Uh, for me, I think, you know, if it's enjoyable, it's more likely to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. If people feel better, they're more likely to sustain it. But they're still battling against this food environment, which is ultra processed food. Yes. And I think, you know, that's why for me, uh, part of my work isn't just about explaining the science for individuals to be helped, which is great, but to sustain it and help more people, we need to make sure that this sort of food is, is abundantly available and affordable for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, then we, we can sort this out on a population level as well and, and help people sustain this for a longer period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where a lot of, you know, on my other side, which is healthdaddy.com, which is not for profit, you know, we're, we are lobbying the Eat Well guidelines. I know you're doing the same to say, look, we have to scrap them or change them or do something because while those eat, guideline, eat well guidelines are in place, then it's very easy for the big food corporations peddling their sugar loaded, chemically infused nonsense to us just to hide behind the guidelines. So let's get rid of them or at least get them changed. I also think you can't have one guideline for everybody. You know? No, sure. If somebody is slender and very active and doing all the things you suggested, like walking every day, occasional sprinting, lifting some weights and younger, of course, you can have a few carbohydrates. Yeah, have some porridge. But if, you're my, and... but if you're my dad, who's diabetic, injecting himself every day, he should be avoiding them as much as he can to try and reduce that medication. Absolutely. And eventually, hopefully, hopefully come off it. Sure, 100%. So let's keep on lobbying against those <laughs> guidelines. And it's great. Well, you've got Tom Watson as a complete advocate. So who knows what's going to happen in politics? Maybe one day uh, he can have a, a, a bigger influence uh, on it. Um, let's just, while we've been talking about exercise, Let's put these into some sort of not, I don't want to put chart because it's different for everybody. But exercise is good as in walking, but not too much running and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you had to say the number one preventative thing, or if you've already concerned about maybe your arteries may be clogging up and you just got a feeling that that might be you, we're going to have a CAC scan just to put your mind at rest because stress is a bad thing anyway. But if you aren't going to have a CAC scan, would you say start diet first? Start to look at yes. understanding food. Because actually the diet's the wrong word, isn't it? Because uh, diet is like a fad word. Diet, well, the well, actual diet word is a Greek word for yeah, way. Yeah, it's, exactly. a, it's a lifestyle. Lifestyle change. Absolutely. So in, in our understanding, yours and mine, of what diet means, yes, you should be on a diet, but not one of these fad diets. I've always said change really happens when people understand. The problem with calorie counting, I've known so many people on diets, and I've I been know. on all of them over the years, where you were told what to do but didn't really understand it, then eventually you get become fat again. So you know, it's about understanding the basics of macronutrients, those carbs, proteins, and fats, and understanding which keep you slender and which make you fat. Yeah, listen, you can have something that's zero calorie, but it's going to make you overweight. Isn't that amazing? So if you, for me, um, you know, these diet drinks, for example, they actually work as appetite stimulants quite often. So you end mm -hmm. up eating more. Yep. Often. So you've got to think about how is what you're consuming affecting your appetite control mechanisms, the hormones, your metabolism. Yes. It's not just about simple calories in, calories out. Calories do matter, yep. but where the calories come from matter more. And when you eat nutritious, healthy foods, mm -hmm. in general, your body corrects itself. There was no obesity in, in our grandparents' generation. Yep. They weren't counting calories, were they? Yeah, they weren't. They were just uh, eating real food. Just eating food without labels on it that exactly. came out of the ground. And if you think about the three macronutrients, and people say, well, it is about counting calories, and that's where they hide behind some of these big food companies. I say that a calorie from fat is different to a calorie from protein, which is different from a calorie from carbs. And some people say that's rubbish. I say, OK, think of it another way. A hundred dollars, a hundred euros, and a hundred pounds are all a hundred of a currency, but they all buy you different things. It's exactly what the case is with food. So you need to understand the basics of food Understand that fat's not the bad guy. I'll tell you what I'd like to probably end up this session on. We're talking about how the speed of reversal of heart disease. We're talking about how too much exercise could kill you. We haven't yet touched on that word that, that 
I've been paranoid about for years and it's caused me untold stress because I've been threatened to go on statins by my doctor so many times. Tell me about cholesterol because we haven't mentioned cholesterol okay, so, yet. So it's a very good question. So for years, what I learned in medical school is high cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease. And in fact, it's been at the heart of public health policy and amongst cardiologists and um, you know, uh, even through to GPs that the most important thing we can do to reduce risk of heart disease, the number one target is cholesterol and get it as low as possible. And let's explain where that came from. So there was a study that we carried out over several decades, started in the 1950s in a town called Framingham, Massachusetts in the United States. And they followed up 5,000 people. And from that, lots of publications and you know, medical uh, in journals came to try and look at various risk factors to try and determine mm -hmm. disease. So we got smoking, about exercise. Now, cholesterol emerged as a so-called risk factor from that study. But to find an association, a strong association with high cholesterol and heart disease. And that was true. However, the levels were actually very, very high, um, affecting a very small proportion of people. Um, so it's only they found that the association was strong if your total cholesterol was above 10. Now, I no, rarely see patients who have a cholesterol yep. anywhere close to that. Yep. Uh, and we now know that that is linked to a genetic condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. So genetic condition where people have got very high cholesterol levels. Interestingly on that, um, and that affects about 1 in 250 people, Steve. But interestingly on that, another uh, thing that is, is misunderstood a lot of our cholesterol, total cholesterol, generally is genetically determined anyway. Mm -hmm. Probably about 80% of it. We can influence it by diet slightly. So there's a genetic thing. Now on the other side, the people with very low cholesterol levels, less than 3.8 total cholesterol, genetically, had almost no heart disease or less heart disease. But for most of the population in the middle, 90% plus, your total cholesterol did not determine who was going to get heart disease and who wasn't. Right. Okay. But what's happened is there's been a mindset that we need to get everyone's cholesterol lower, lower, as low as possible into this less than 4 category or less than 3.8 and that's the base way to combat heart disease. Now what, how can you do that? There are two ways. You can do it from diet but the studies have now confirmed that lowering saturated fat does not have any impact on heart attack, strokes, death, whatever. Okay, So basically a waste of time. Potentially harmful. Uh, one study showed that people, heart attack patients who lowered their cholesterol um, using a, a safflower oil containing margarine had more death rates than the mm. patients that had butter instead. So this is, you know, so on that, what I would say, I quote a colleague of mine, Rita Redberg, who's a cardiologist in America, and she says, cholesterol is just a lab number. Who cares about lowering cholesterol unless it translates into a benefit for patients? Agreed. Okay, so I say don't think about lowering cholesterol, think about these other things, and cholesterol's further down the bottom, if that, in terms of, should be the focus. Um, and it's also true, I've, I've read somewhere, that if you have too low a cholesterol, that's equally dangerous. Yeah. So, so interesting, as you get older, the lower cholesterol, higher mortality rates, which is what we found in our study uh, when we looked at people over the age of 60. The other side is drugs. So you can take yep. drugs. Statins are prescribed to 8 million people in this country, mm. um, probably about 100 million people around the world taking statin drugs. 8 million in the UK alone? 8 million in the UK alone prescribed that's, about 100 million. That's more than 1 in 10 people are on statins. And we know that unless you've got heart disease, you're not going to live longer taking a statin. And then you've got the whole issue of side effects, which can affect, in my view, anything up to from anything from 20%, maybe even 50%, depending on what your individual makeup is. Well, that, um, that, that's frightening, isn't it? So my doctor for years was trying to push statins or certainly threaten me with statins unless I got my cholesterol down. Mm. And yet research I've read recently, backed up by Bloomberg, is that it takes 300 people, they call it numbers needed to treat. Yes. Around 300 to get one benefit. And yet the side effects are way higher than the benefits. Yeah, that's in the low risk category, absolutely. Yeah. And most people taking statins around the world are in low risk, but they're not told this. So it's, it's a flawed approach. Um, it's, it seems to have failed to curb heart disease from data that we've looked at. Um, and the reason for that is partly because there's another way of looking at this, the data and statistics. So if you take an, a, an average increase in life expectancy in people with heart disease, taking statins every day religiously for five years, and you take it as an average, mm -hmm. the average increase in life expectancy, Steve, uh, based upon industry-sponsored data that's selected and probably weeds out people with side effects. Yeah. Four days you'll live longer over a five year period. So you've got to take the drugs for five years, possibly having big side effects, 
to get four days get increase four days on average, increase on average in over life. that five year period. Oh. Right? You can, you can extrapolate out to yeah, yeah, 10 yeah, years yeah. or whatever, yeah. but it's still a lot less than what people yeah. are led to believe. And then when you look at the data on people stopping their statin, and this is before any awareness of side effects, about half of them who are prescribed it will stop it within a couple of years of being prescribed. So even if statins work, which I think there probably is some small benefit, I genuinely think there is some small benefit, yeah. but one, tell the patient, two, on a population level, because of the side effects and discontinuation rates, yeah. they've failed to curb heart disease. It's a failed model, yeah. and we should be focusing on insulin resistance yeah. and inflammation. And Dr. Michael Kendrick says, there is slight evidence that, that you know, in that one in 300, it might help prevent heart disease, but actually it's probably a byproduct and nothing still to do with lowering the cholesterol. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about this in British, in British Medical Journal in 2013, that my own understanding, having looked at, there were other drug trials that lowered cholesterol that didn't have an effect on heart attacks, but statins seemed to work. So the question is why? Is there another mechanism? And there is some evidence to suggest it's anti-inflammatory or has some reduction in clots or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably more likely to be an independent of cholesterol lowering mechanism. So lowering cholesterol isn't, it's failed. Yeah. It has failed and it shouldn't be the focus, certainly for most people. Now, if you've got this genetic condition with very high cholesterol, from, it might be different for you and it may yeah. have some benefit. But you said um, that's one in 200, one in 300. One in 250. Yeah. Um, but I've seen a number of patients with that diagnosed for the first time as having high cholesterol in their 50s, never been checked before, likely genetic. They've had it for all their life. And then we've done imaging on them and found there's no artery disease whatsoever. So for those people, high cholesterol is not a problem for them and they don't have to worry about a statin. And we've had that conversation and we've, we, you know, and they've made informed decisions they don't need. So these even, are people, so these are people with if, cholesterols of 15 or 20, so maybe. These, these are, are very high. With this rare genetic disorder, one in 250, that still doesn't mean they're going to have a heart attack. Absolutely not. And doesn't even mean that they need to go on statin. So, they should go and have a proper scan, a CAC yeah. or something. And so we know 50% of men and 70% of women untreated who have familial hyperlipidemia will not develop premature heart disease. Wow. So we're not, what we need to do with the science is try and figure out, yeah. is there something else going on? There is some evidence that it's that some of these people, it's actually because they're, they're more clottability of the blood. Yeah. And that's actually the issue. Um, but that needs to expand. I think it's been a slightly lazy approach. And obviously, there's a, you know, we're talking about an industry here, without being naive, Steve. Um, sales of statin drugs, total revenues are estimated to reach one trillion US dollars by next year. Oh. So there's so much money involved in this cholesterol hypothesis. So it's going to take a bit more time to break that wall down. Yeah, but, I, but I'll do my bit. And can I say, can I suggest everybody <laughs> that, that disputes or thinks, oh, maybe this is, is just going too far, read Malcolm Kendrick's book called Doctrine Data to find out who eight of the nine members on the panel for suggesting that we should lower cholesterol by just a tiny point of 1% were funded by, because they were all funded by the big pharmaceutical companies. And every little bit they can drop down what is now the acceptable range of cholesterol means more and more billions of dollars for the industry. Yeah, the, the next approach is let's just get it lower and lower and lower. Yeah. And then we all die from not having enough cholesterol. I'm going to ask a question, and, and you don't have to answer. First question is, how many physical heart operations keyholes have you done in, in, over, over the years? So, okay. And, uh, and, and that's the first question. Yeah. And then to back up what we've been talking about, things go through your head, it must be, while you're operating. Obviously, you're concentrating on uh, doing, I can never do it because my eye to hand coordination is terrible, but you know, so you've got to be very careful when you're in these operations. But going through your head, I bet it never goes, you should have lowered your cholesterol. It must have been lifestyle must have been, oh, if only yeah. you'd come in six months ago, if only if you'd come in a year ago and I could have helped you with the weight, taught you about carb, taught you about carbohydrates, taught you about the importance of avoiding packaged foods. It, it must be loads of emotions as you're yeah, operating sure. on Absolutely, people. absolutely. So two things. One, in terms of my clinical experience in managing patients with heart disease, um, tens of thousands over the years, uh, pet, pet, total patients and, and thousands of people with heart disease. Uh, angiograms, uh, which are the visualization of the arteries, I've done over a thousand of those. And in people having stents put in, uh, either for what we call stable disease, if they've got quite bad symptoms, but more importantly, heart attacks, I've done hundreds of those. Yeah. So that's my background, experience, uh, and knowledge. In terms of, Steve, you're absolutely right. And you, you, I mean, you're a very passionate guy. You're very, your empathy levels are amazing. I mean, you really care about people, a lot to do, I think, with the tragic story of your brother dying young and obviously sadly losing your mom last year. 
So you must really feel, these are human beings, we're yeah. not talking. Oh. I always say that yeah, a million people dying of something is just a statistic, but one person is a tragedy. You must yeah. really, really yeah. bring it home for no, you. No, it does, and you know, you go into medicine, you're gonna, and it's cardiology, you're on the front line. So the people that come in and have cardiac arrests have had a heart attack outside hospital, they're being resuscitated, they're coming in on the table, and we can sometimes help them, sometimes they die in front of us. We've got to go and speak to the family. It's yeah. one of the worst things that, you know, it's something you have to do, you get used to. Uh, and you have to be compassionate, but it, it's something I w I'd rather I didn't have to do. I'd, yeah. I'd rather not have to go to a family who lost, you know, um, their father or their, their brother, you know, their sister, you know, their mum uh, in their 50s or early 60s from something that was entirely avoidable. Yeah. You know, and, and for me, um, that, you know, inspires me to keep going. And, and yeah. the patients I see in my outpatients as well um, who come in, you know, who have really suffered or they've, you know, because of their, of their lifestyle because they didn't know any better and they were yeah. given wrong information. It must really frustrate you. Uh, I, I had uh, uh, Robert Holden in uh, recently and um, he was saying that what really annoyed him with the Eat Lancet report, which pretty much said everybody in the world should go vegan or vegetarian or you know, should definitely stop eating meat. He said, I was so frustrated because while there were 30 of them, not one of them was a farmer. Nobody came and asked me as an organic farmer, what is the right thing to do? And it must be the same for you, having so many people peddling the wrong information around cholesterol uh, and the wrong information around saturated fat. When you're the guy on the front line operating on people, yes. seeing thousands of people where fat families have been affected, where they've lost loved ones, knowing that actually most of what we're told is a lie and actually we can all reverse it quite quickly if we just come back to living primarily, eating yeah. the right food, avoiding I, the chemical nonsense that we eat. And yeah, I think one handicap as well, Steve, with a lot of these people who push these guidelines, they don't have any, and listen, I respect academics who do their work rigorously, but I think one issue is a lot of people are out of touch with, they don't have patient contact. Yes. And they're also out of touch with what patient want, want, wants, you know. Um, and I think that's also crucial because, you know, evidence-based medicine, which is what I advocate for, is to improve people's health outcomes. But there are three components. How do you do that? One is use your own clinical experience as a doctor. Yep. Best available evidence, although we, we know that a lot of that has been corrupted by commercial influence. So I have, mm -hmm. to, I have to cut through you know, um, the misinformation there, uh, if you like. And last but not least is take into consideration patient values and preferences. And that means having a conversation with them about what they really want, you know, uh, and 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 being fu and fully informing them, which yep. again doesn't fully happen, and then they make a decision of whether it's about taking a statin, having a stent done, or following a particular lifestyle plan, and it's to help them in the best possible way. But if we just have you know one approach that patient comes in, cholesterol according to a guideline which is not based upon any rigorous evidence suggests that the cholesterol is high, give them a statin, and then they're scaremongered. You must take the statin or you will die which is actually what happens, yep. then um, patients being which causes misinformed. causes more stress. <laughs> patients becoming misinformed yeah. and, and inadvertently harmed because yeah. you know, one of the quick thing I'll touch on is one of the things I used to see um, is uh, something called statin gluttony. So people are given this drug to lower their cholesterol, given the illusion of protection, and it means they can eat what they like. They think they, it's like the, the whole exercise thing. Yeah. As long as you exercise, you can eat what you like. Same thing with statins in some yeah. ways. And the study showed that patients with the same risk factors followed up in middle age, followed up over 10 years, the ones that took statins ended up more overweight than the people that didn't. Because of this, this... You're relying on that pill for every ill mentality. Well, you think, and you of, think that cholesterol, yeah. it means your diet's fine, you can eat what you like, yeah. so you can go and eat junk food. Yeah. And they end up getting diabetes and being obese, but their cholesterol's fine, so who cares? <laughs> and in fact, there are some That's cardiologists funny. that actually believe this as well and think that way. Well, I'm not worried about the rest of it, we've got your cholesterol down. Because you know, they're, they're, they're making that decision or their understanding is, is flawed and they haven't really looked at it in depth. And they've accepted uh, information that has been, um, you know, peddled as rigorous independent yes. science yep. as a gospel truth, when in fact it often is the complete opposite. Yeah, I and mean, we have a phrase in business, you know, stand back for the coal face, take a helicopter view uh, and, and see what's going on. And, you know, I can't say, I can't support doctors enough because 99.9% .9 are trying to do what they got into med medicine for, which is to help their patients. But with such an onslaught of patients coming in now, and we're a very sick country overall, we're dying younger, you know, they're at that cold face and they can't stand back. Thank goodness though, yourself, uh, Dr. David Unwin, Malcolm Kendrick, and a whole host of others now are stepping back saying, hang on a minute, 
<laughs> we've got to step back a little bit, even though we're stressed, we've got so much going on, because we've got to stop this from happening in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it's gr- and the, the 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 whole world and I, I can say things so I'm not a doctor that probably can't say it is corrupt and we are misled by corporate greed and 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 it's not so much individuals that have deliberately harmed us as a nation it's they're doing what they're paid to do which is return shareholder investment yeah uh, whether you be a food company whether you be Coca Cola McDonald's whether you be a big pharmaceutical company you know. Pharmaceutical companies don't want us to get healthy because if we get healthy, we stop taking pills. You know, food companies want us to keep eating their products, so we keep putting more things in to make them addictive, like more sugar, more chemicals to make them addictive, just like cigarettes. And you're up against this whole war. But thank goodness, yourself, Malcolm, David, and many others are stepping back now and saying, "Time now to reflect on why we're a sick nation. Time now, in your case, you know, going to southern Italy to and looking at." How are they living longer? Why, why in, in Europe are some people in some areas, it's got a bit to do, I guess, with the environment and the climate, but why are they living so much longer than we are in the UK? And, and, and just thank you for that research. So I'll tell you what, I'm 53, you're a lot younger. Um, give me then, if it's not too, if too much exercise can kill me, and I believe that, that's why I don't do as much these days, and I'm definitely much more healthy for it. As well as cutting back on the exercise, I already buy into um, sort of the high fat, low carbs. Is there anything else you'd, you'd, you'd recommend? Um, make sure you're getting, I mean, we spoke about this last night, but you know, make sure you're getting at least seven hours sleep a night. Yeah. For sure. Sleep, uh, sunshine. 30, 30 minutes of, of meditation a day. Yeah. You know, whether it's yoga, Pilates, or just deep breathing, for sure. Um, that's what I'd recommend for you. But Brilliant. otherwise, I think you're. You're on, you're on course to live to 100, mate. Good. I'm working on it. So uh, <laughs> stop being paranoid about cholesterol. Again, get all these things checked. If you want to benefit, go and see your GP. That's, that's what they're there for. But also, do your, you know, if you are diagnosed with high cholesterol, go and do your own research. And lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. You know, uh, you know, we've had cholesterol for the last 2 million years. Cholesterol has worked perfectly in our body and works perfectly in the bodies of people in remote communities. It's those other influences that are happening to us in this westernized world that are causing the problem. But of course, then when we have problems, people make drugs to sell to us and peddle to us. I said, you said something last night, which I thought was fascinating. You said that what tends to happen with drug companies because their businesses, they do find something that alleviates some problems for people that have got real severe symptoms of that problem. But of course, every business then needs to grow and expand and expand and expand. So eventually, though, it gets past the point with most medication where it's really doing. Yeah, and uh, then the harm outweighs any good, yeah. and then you've got a problem. And that's you know that's a, a regulatory system failure. Um, you know, it's driven by greed, uh, and I think that's the, and then it causes it causes more harm than good. Um, and and then they deliberately try and cover up stuff to when people try and expose that this is of no benefit or we should be telling people the truth. So that's where things get very murky, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's the way it's the way some business is done, but it's, it's certainly yeah. a lot of, of big business that have a lot yeah. of power. Yeah. Uh, so we need to change the whole really and change the, the whole system. system needs Absolutely. To change. And that comes through knowledge and hopefully podcasts like this and broadcasts like this help get that you know, knowledge out there. I mean, there's a friend of mine who you probably know, Robert Lustig, who's yep, a brilliant. Genius. professor of, uh, of endocrinology, you know, sugar guru. Yeah. Uh, and we have, we, you know, he's a very good friend of mine. And he said, you know, to me, and I, I repeat this, is that I have no problem with people making money doing the right thing. I have a problem with people making money doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. That's a great line. His book, by the way, is a great book. It's, although it's called Hacking the American Mind, take the American bit out, it's, it, it's, it's all about what's, how we've been promoted happiness from all these big food companies, and yet happiness and pleasure are two different. This whole thing is the difference between yeah. pleasure and happiness, and pleasure actually is like a short-term game. Yeah. And you know, we eat that McDonald's, have that Coke, because it gives us instant pleasure, but it destroys our long-term happiness exactly. and how and yet all the companies are using the word happy and play uh, and so on to market to us when actually they're selling completely the opposite. So uh, read that uh, uh, great book by Robert called Hacking the American Mind. And for people to follow, we've come to our end sadly, it's gone, <laughs> gone very, very quickly. For people who want to follow you more, tell us about your book, which is I think the yeah, Penguin. Uh, uh, Pioppy Diet, you can get that on, on Amazon. Um, uh, my website is drasim.com. And if you know people can contact me there as well if they want to 
consultation or whatever. I also do consultations. Where are you um, based? You're, you're in London? Or? So, I mean, NHS work, but also uh, off Harley Street as well. So there's a lot of people that really want a transparent conversation of understanding how they can reduce their risk. But if they're on a statin, for example, a lot of people come to me and need that honest conversation about stents, heart disease. So that's my main focus and my interest and passion. Um, and then on, I'm on social media, Dr. Asim Malhotra on Twitter, Instagram, Lifestyle Medicine Doctor, and Facebook as well, Dr. Asim Malhotra. Well, look, please just keep doing what you're doing. The, the more successful you'll come, the more those big giants will come after you, try and put, you know, suppress you and push you down. But keep doing what you're doing, and I, I, I think your aspiration of helping a million people at a time will come to fruition. Thank you for everything. It's been a fabulous hour. I hope you've all enjoyed listening and watching to it. And I'm sure, hopefully, we'll see you again. Thank you, Steve. Thank pleasure. you. Lovely. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.